Hello, good evening. Give the panelists a minute to sit down and people to come in, but uh, we thought this, given the excitement around this panel, that we'll get started on time. So, um, as I mentioned, good evening. I'm Ramanan Krishnamurti. I'm the Chief Energy Officer here at the University of Houston. And for those of you who are sort of curious as to why that title, just make an acronym out of it. That's the only way I was going to be a CEO anywhere in the world. Okay, so, um, so, so uh, welcome to the second event of the 2016-2017 Energy Symposium series, uh, Critical Issues in Energy. Tonight's topic is sort of, uh, uh, it's uh, going backwards and forwards, uh, is on shale development in Texas, six degrees of consideration. And for those of you who have been uh, following this series, the very first one that we did in this uh, series was on hydraulic fracturing and the sustainability of it. And today we've got a panel here from the Temist Shale Task Force. Uh, this is the Academy of Medicine, Engineering, and Science of Texas uh, that has put a uh, task force on shale uh, led by uh, Christine here. Um, and, and on the panel we have um, six experts um, who are going to give us the six degrees of consideration. We really appreciate their participation here and uh, the, the support from Temist in, in organizing this event. Uh, a big thank you to our uh, media partner, Houston Public Media. Uh, they have um, really been a, a true supporter of uh, what we put together here. And for those, those of you who want to go back and look at this uh, later on, this entire program will be recorded, made available to you on our website, so you feel free to uh, watch that. For those of you who've got friends at home who can't be here, tell them that this is being live streamed on the web, that they can actually go on the UH Energy website and actually watch it live. Um, so uh, we also want to thank you uh, as, as our audience for being here and for participating in this event. I'd like to recognize a special group of people, uh, the UH uh, President's Energy Advisory Board. This board is made up of industry experts and leaders, and they give us strategic guidance to advance energy education, research, technology transfer, and outreach. And this is really a creation. Uh, this entire symposium series is a creation from their uh, ideas. Uh, finally, uh, as, you as you walked in here, you probably saw a bunch of very bright, sharp students here who've been helping us. These are our student ambassadors and Energy Coalition volunteers, and they've been really the backbone of the support for what UH Energy is putting together. Um, a quick idea, a, a, a note about our question and answer part of the program. Uh, as you probably noticed from your program, uh, we've got a website where you can submit your questions. Uh, these questions will be uh, sort of collated, uh, sort of uh, put all together, uh, and uh, Christine will, uh, will, uh, will pose those questions to, those, uh, to, the, uh, to the panel members. Uh, the, the link will appear periodically, so if you miss it from, uh, from if you don't have your uh, uh, program and you just need the link, you'll find it on, on our screen uh, periodically. So without further uh, sort of uh, uh, ado and delay, let me introduce our moderator here, uh, Christine Economides. Christine's been an old friend of mine. Uh, she's a professor of petroleum engineering, an expert in reservoir engineering uh, here at the University of Houston. Uh, Christine serves as the chair of the Temist Shale Task Force. Um, she, prior to her current position here at UH, Christine taught at Texas A&M University for 10 years, had been at University of Houston for a few years before that, uh, and then worked 20 years before that uh, at Schlumberger. So with that, Christine, a pleasure to have you here and a pleasure to have all of you on the panel. Thank you. All right. So everybody knows by now what our subject is, uh, shale development in Texas. Do we have any geologists in the room? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, just for you guys, I want to clarify that by shale, we include tight oil and shale gas, okay? Even if they're not technically shale, okay? Just, you know, just for the geologists. Well, <laughs> so, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> so, uh, as you have heard, um, 
our panelists are members of a task force which I am chairing. Uh, and this initiative is funded by the George and Cynthia Mitchell Foundation and as well by the Academy of Medicine, Engineering and Science of Texas, uh, which we uh, call TAMEST in the short form. Uh, so TAMEST uh, works to highlight Texas as a research destination. It's a nonprofit organization composed of all of the state's National Academy members and Nobel laureates, uh, and also the 18 research universities that have those members. So a little bit about our task force effort. Uh, we're preparing a re report designed to help all Texans understand what we do and do not know about the potential environmental and other impacts of shale development and hydraulic fracturing for oil and gas. Both the public and decision makers are continuously provided with potentially confusing and or conflicting information. Uh, the goal of our study is to evaluate the scientific basis of the current body of information available uh, both positive and negative, and effectively communicate to the public the current state of knowledge of environmental and community impacts. So this study will include uh, assessments of existing studies on air, land, water, seismicity, transportation, and socioeconomics in the shale development areas in Texas. Uh, the panel members represent each of these impact areas. Um, so on behalf of the task force, uh, we wish to thank UH Energy for the invitation to talk about what we're doing and what we're learning. Uh, so the panel members uh, each will speak briefly on uh, one of these topics, and then we'll open this session for questions. Uh, so, um, you've been hearing the instructions about uh, how to submit the questions, and uh, you can see that again right now, uh, and we'll kind of weave it in a few more times. Uh, I think if you ha if have a copy of the program, the information is also there. Uh, so that's really all I wanted to say. I'm very anxious to get started with what our panel members have to say. Uh, so I want to introduce our first speaker. Uh, this is Dr. Brian Stomp. He's the Albritton Professor of Earth Sciences at the Southern Methodist University in Dallas. That would be SMU. Um, and Brian will start off to speak with us about geology and seismicity. Thanks, Christine. Um, right, we need the, uh, to advance the slide. Oh, there it is. Okay, there we go. Sorry. Um, let me move ahead, and I want to I want to start just with a little bit of, of geology, and uh, certainly the tectonic map of, of Texas is a place to to begin, and and we understand that uh, in Texas uh, we have rich reserves because of a long tectonic history of hundreds of millions of years. Um, two things uh, about that history: one are these uh, wonderful reserves in the basins um, across um, the state and also the remnant faults that uh, complement those basins. And uh, we're gonna come back to that as we, as we move along the way. And in particular, as we were talking about the uh, um, tight shales, we're, we're interested in um, certainly the Barnett um, in and around the Dallas area, the Eagleford to the south, the Haynesville to the east, and the far west side of the Permian as, as places uh, for these, these reserves. Um, I was asked to kind of give an overview of the seismicity to uh, um, put some context in the relationship between these basins and the oil and gas production and possible relationships um, with induced uh, earthquakes. And on your far left is a, is a plot that's um, been produced by the United States Geological Survey 
of earthquake rate across the um, eastern and central United States with time. And you can see it goes back to 1975 when we had a consistent set of instruments to be able to measure and locate magnitude 3 and above, including here in Texas. And if you follow this plot, you'll see that somewhere between 2005 and 2008, there's a rapid increase in seismicity. It is dominated by earthquakes in Oklahoma and Kansas, certainly. Um, but uh, if we uh, m um, uh, move ahead uh, uh, one more, we see a similar map for Texas. And uh, in this particular case, uh, many fewer earthquakes. Um, but you can see in this, in this plot um, events that uh, in a recently um, um, published paper talks about strong evidence for the relationship for, from water disposal and earthquakes and then um, natural tectonic earthquakes in the uh, yellow and, um, and in the green. And you can see that across the state of Texas. And then on the right are the injection wells that go along with that. Um, I would want to say something really early on here is that uh, whether or not these events that are titled as induced here are induced, I think it's a general uh, conclusion within the community that these are related not to hydrofracture, that they are related in the United States uh, to the, possibly to the disposal of, of fluids at depth. This is not a, a, a new story, it's an old story that goes back to the 1920s here in Texas. Um, this is a, uh, a plot that shows wastewater injection now in Colorado at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal over a five-year time period. These were um, chemical waste uh, materials from, uh, from war, war um, residuals. And uh, on the top plot is the volumes of injected fluids. And on the bottom plot are the number of earthquakes. And you can follow the ups and downs of the injection with the ups and downs of the earthquakes. Um, there was a time period where the uh, uh, injection stopped. And you can see the decay, but not the end of the earthquakes. And then the injections were ramped back up culminating in a magnitude 5.3 that uh, ended the, uh, the, uh, the, the project. Um, back in the 60s and moving through the 70s and 80s, we began to develop an understanding of the uh, possible role of fluids and earthquakes. And on the far um, left of this figure is a um, artist's rendition of injection of fluids underground. And then if those fluids can move horizontally, um, if they come into um, interaction with, with any existing faults, and remember that first picture I showed of the old faults in Texas, many of them 100 to 200 million years old, um, those fluids can change the stress regimes on those faults and trigger small to moderate earthquakes. And this is the model that uh, I think uh, um, a number of us are, are working on to try to understand, but kind of explains this relationship between wastewater disposal and, uh, and earthquakes. Um, if, if, we, if you go back to the number of earthquakes, even here in Texas, there are very few. And there are thousands of injection wells associated with this. So it's, it's not a common process that uh, the earthquakes will be triggered. But if I do have an injector, I have a path to a fault and a nearby fault, then we have the opportunity possibly of inducing earthquakes. And this has been recognized by industry, by regulators, by the um, scientific community. And over the last three years, I think we've made significant progress with a number of uh, national studies on these issues, one of which is, is, is shown here. And there are two conclusions which I've highlighted. And the first is what I already talked about is that in the US, we believe hydraulic fracking um, does not pose a high risk for inducing felt earthquakes. And then the other is there are very few events um, over the last several decades um, uh, relative to the large number of disposal wells. That does not mean it isn't a, a, a issue to, to deal with because this is a hazard, particularly if the earthquakes are big enough to local communities. Um, I live in Dallas and we've had a number of earthquakes up to the, uh, magnitude four. And the concern is what happens if those earthquakes get a little bit bigger and what the damage might be. 
Uh, FEMA ran some models over the last year to look at a magnitude 4.8 and a magnitude 5.6. And just to put this into some perspective, um, the uh, 5.6 is about $15 billion worth of damage to the Dallas Fort Worth area of direct damage. And uh, the 4.6 would be about $2.5 billion. And so this motivates us to understand and, and mitigate these, these effects and try to understand the relationships and how best to dispose of fluids. Which brings me to my end, and that is um, in uh, the uh, spring of 2015, the Texas legislature recognizing um, that we needed to understand seismicity in Texas and its relationship to oil and gas, um, developed what's called TexNet, which is $4.47 million that's uh, being funded. They're um, beginning uh, the second year of this project, and um, the Bureau of Economic Geology is distributing seismic stations in, across the, uh, um, the state. They have portable instruments for responding to some of these events, and then a robust research program understanding where faults are, how fluids flow, and how best to dispose of these fluids along the way. Um, I'm going to end at this, but I will mention that uh, TexNet has a, its first year report that will go to the governor on Thursday. And I would encourage you, that will be publicly available, and I think provides a good context for looking at these issues from Texas' perspective. How about this one? Now are they both on? No. You think they're both on? This one should go off. Okay, now this one's on. All the way to the back, you hear me, right? Okay, so uh, thanks very much, Brian. And our second speaker is Dr. David Allen. Uh, he's a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Texas in Austin. And uh, David will speak about impacts of shale development on the air we breathe. Hey, thank you, Christine. Um, as was mentioned, I'm going to talk about the second of the six dimensions that you'll be hearing about tonight. You've now heard about it, uh, seismicity. Now we'll hear about uh, effects on the atmosphere. There are multiple ways in which emissions from the development of shale resources impact the atmosphere, and we can group them into three broad categories, and the TAMIST report will deal with all of these categories. They include uh, the formation of photochemical smog. Uh, they include the emission of uh, compounds into the atmosphere that can be directly toxic, and they include greenhouse gases. And now while the TAMIS report will deal with all of these, given the limited amount of time that each of us has tonight, I've decided just to uh, frame my presentation to you around one of these issues. There are many common elements associated with these issues, and the greenhouse gas issue that I'm going to discuss with you uh, has many of these common elements. Uh, if you're interested in some of the others, certainly welcome to uh, address those through questions that we can answer. So what are the greenhouse gas issues? Uh, natural gas, uh, which can be derived extensively from shale resources, has been uh, proposed as a bridge fuel to a lower carbon intensity uh, energy system in the United States. And one of the principal reasons for that is that when we burn natural gas, we emit less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than when we burn other fossil fuels. And here the comparison is with coal. Uh, roughly twice as much CO2 going into the atmosphere, generating electricity from coal as compared to generating electricity from natural gas. So what's the issue? Well, the issue is the rest of the supply chain, and in particular, uh, emissions of natural gas along the natural gas supply chain. So as we get the natural gas from the well to the burner tip and combust it to generate electricity, there's the possibility that we'll have emissions of natural gas along that supply chain. And 
The principal component of natural gas is the compound methane, and methane is substantially more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. How much more potent? Well, unfortunately, the answer is it depends, and the answer isn't entirely scientifically based in terms of what the variability is. So here you see me citing that uh, methane is 28 to 120 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. And those are reasonably precise scientifically. So why the wide variation? Well, the reason for the wide variation in this number is the fact that methane is converted in the atmosphere into carbon dioxide. That conversion takes place over roughly a decadal time scale. Half-life, for those of you who are chemists or chemical engineers, half-life is a little over 10 years. So if we emit methane uh, into the atmosphere, for the next 10 years, roughly, it will remain as methane. But beyond that, it will be in the form of carbon dioxide. So if our time horizon for being worried about climate effects is a century, which has been the common practice of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, then for the first 10 years, that carbon is in methane. And for the next 90 years, it's in the form of carbon dioxide. So if we take a 100-year time horizon, then the potency of methane as a greenhouse gas is somewhere between 28 and 32 times as much as CO2. On the other hand, if we ask the question, what's the immediate effect on the atmosphere? I emit a kilogram of methane today, how much CO2 would I need to emit to get the equivalent potency in terms of radiative forcing? The answer is 120 times as much. So it really depends on whether our planning horizon for climate is today, or the next decade, or the next 20 years, or the next 100 years. And that's a policy question. So the science tells us what that curve it looks like, but whether it's 28 or 120 times as potent really is a policy decision for us. Nevertheless, we can take into account that variability and basically ask the question, how much methane could leak along the supply chain and still give us that climate benefit that we get from the less carbon-intensive combustion? What leak rate can we tolerate? So um, that's addressed here. And I'm going to show you a plot and let me walk you through this plot. It's a relatively complicated plot because the issue is relatively complex. And this was developed by researchers at Princeton and Environmental Defense Fund. And on the far left of this plot, what you see is the percentage of natural gas that could leak along the supply chain and still give us a climate benefit if we want that benefit to be immediate. In other words, we're going to take that potency of 120 times that of CO2. So what you see is if we get to below 3% uh, for switching from coal to natural gas to generate electricity, then we're going to get a net climate benefit. And that benefit just increases as we go to longer and longer planning horizons for CO2. It becomes a little more difficult if the switch is for petroleum or for diesel which are less carbon intensive than coal. But let's just say that the range is somewhere between one and 6%, if we can do better than that in the leak rate, uh, then the switch from these other fossil fuels to natural gas will give us a climate benefit. So what is the leak rate? Well, until about three years ago, there were very little data on what the emission rates along the natural gas supply chain are. And over the last three to four years, there have been extensive results, uh, particularly here in Texas, looking at what those leak rates are. I'm trying to go back one now. Okay, I'm not getting it to go back one. So I'll just tell you that the leak rate uh, no, other way. So the leak rate is over the supply chain roughly 1.0 to 1.2% averaged across the entire country. So 1% to 1.2%. So 
Uh, that's part of the story. So it seems to tell us that the switch from coal to natural gas is unambiguously a climate benefit on average across the United States. The issue is that what we're seeing from all these studies that have been done is that there's huge spatial variability, number one, and number two, that a small subset of the sources, that might be a well site, it might be a piece of equipment, a small subset of the sources dominate the emissions. This is the concept of a super emitter, and you've all, whether you know it or not, experienced super emitters. The air pollution community of which I'm a part has known for decades that half of the vehicles on the road, half of the emissions from the vehicles on the road are given to us by about 10% of the vehicles. So one car in 10 driving down the road gives us half of the emissions. Um, and you've undoubtedly driven behind some of those cars and you've been able to identify them. Uh, we see the same phenomenon along the natural gas supply chain. A small subset of the sites or the pieces of equipment give us the majority of the emissions. So 2% of the sites in the Barnett Shale give us half of the emissions. Uh, small subsets of uh, these sources give us emissions. So what's next? What do we do? Well, there's pending re federal regulation on emissions. What will happen with that is speculation at this point. Uh, but there are pending federal regulations from the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of the Interior through the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, there are new sensing technologies that might be able to detect these super emitters that are out there and are being tested by various organizations now. You'll get a review of this from the TAMIS study when it's released. And there will also be a National Academy study that's just been announced uh, looking specifically at this issue that I've talked about tonight of methane emissions. So uh, thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Okay, so um, next up is going to be Melinda Taylor. She's a senior lecturer and executive director of the K. Bailey Hutchinson Center for Energy, Law, and Business, again, UT Austin. Uh, and she's going to address uh, impacts of shale development on the land. Thank you, and thank you, Christine. It's nice to be here this evening. Um, as Christine said, I'm the lead on the land group of this TAMS study, but I want to acknowledge first off that I've got a terrific group that, uh, that's working closely with me on this. Uh, Joseph Fitzsimmons, who's a former chair of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Commission, who's also an attorney in San Antonio. Tracy Hester, who's on the law faculty here at the University of Houston. He's an environmental law specialist. And Urs Crowder, who's on the faculty of Texas A&M. Um, He's a professor there in environmental economics. So we have been reviewing the available studies of the impact of shale development on the land resources of Texas. And let me start by saying there is significantly less information out there um, in the scientific literature about the impacts on land resources uh, than there is, for example, with respect to methane emissions or water resources, as you'll hear about later. But we have compiled the information that's available, and I'll sort of give you a quick overview of, of how we're going about our analysis of that and sort of what we've learned so far, although these are, these are not yet findings. We have divided our research into kind of two broad categories. So we're looking at the impact of shale development on property owners, especially those who own the surface rights of property, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, and then we've also looked at the impacts of shale development on sort of land resources in a broader sense, on um, ecosystem services, on wildlife habitat, um, and that sort of thing. So we start with just the proposition that with this shale boom that really started about 2007, 2008, there's been a dramatic expansion in drilling in Texas, right? And we all, we all know that, I think. But just to give you a sense, <clears throat> in 2005, the Texas Railroad Commission issued a little over 4,400 new drilling permits out in the Permian Basin, out in West Texas. 
And nine years later, in 2014, they issued 10,966 per drilling permits out in the Permian. Um, in 2014, same year, statewide, there were 16,914 new permits issued. Now that dropped off substantially, um, sort of midway through 2014 when the price of oil uh, dropped substantially. But that's, that's a lot of drilling activity and a number of those wells, of course, are still in operation. Um, Oil and gas is produced extensively in Texas. Again, that's something we all know intuitively, but it's, it's sort of helpful when you're talking about land resources to remind yourself of that fact. Um, oil and gas is produced in 215 of our 254 counties. So in almost every county in Texas, there's oil and gas development going on. Um, this is a photo that's a NASA satellite photo that was taken of the 16 counties in South Texas in the Eagle Ford at night. The, the lights are from flares associated with um, oil and gas wells down there in, in the Eagle Ford. And it just gives you a sense, of, again, of this sort of scale of spatial development. So what about those impacts on land resources? What do, what do we know about those? And let me go back for a moment to this question of land ownership in Texas. When I'm on the faculty of the law school at the University of Texas, and for those of you who are lawyers or law students, um, you and, and maybe those of you who aren't, um, law professors think about and talk about property rights as being a bundle of rights. It's not sort of you own a piece of land and that's sort of one thing. When you own a piece of property, you own the right to do a lot of different things with that property. And with respect to oil and gas or the minerals that might exist under the surface of that piece of property, in many, many places, in fact, in most places, the mineral rights, the rights to develop the oil and gas have been severed from the surface rights, the rights to own and occupy the surface of the property. And under state law, the state law not only here in Texas but elsewhere, the right to develop the minerals is actually superior to the rights of the surface owner to do to carry out activities on the surface. Well, that may have implications then when we're seeing a pretty, excuse me, an expansive um, extension of oil and gas drilling for surface owners. Um, they don't have a lot of control. In fact, they have no control um, virtually to tell a mineral owner not to enter the property or not to develop a piece of property or to tell the mineral owner how to reclaim or clean up the property when the operation is finished. So there are impacts for surface owners. Aesthetic impacts, occasionally contamination, we don't have a lot of data on contamination, and then again there, that can lead to reduced property values. With respect to that kind of broader suite of ecosystem type impacts um, associated with land, um, there are issues with respect to habitat fragmentation. And this photograph, which was, this is an aerial photo taken in Detroit um, City, Texas, of a particularly intensive area of oil and gas development. You can see visually how the, the well pads, the pipelines, the roads, um, the infrastructure associated with oil and gas development has fragmented or broken up the surface of the land. Some species are particularly sensitive to that type of fragmentation, others are not. Um, but we know that that's, that's a result of this expansion of oil and gas drilling. We see an increase in the number of invasive and sometimes non-native species, plant species is what I mean there, um, because this type of fragmentation and activity can lead to uh, the attraction of invasive plants that can outcompete uh, the native vegetation. As I said, occasionally soil contamination. There's actually very few studies that document any significant expansive soil contamination, but we know that's something of a risk. And then finally, there are impacts for a handful of species that are particularly sensitive to oil and gas development because of where their habitats are. We know that the dune sagebrush lizard, for example, out in West Texas in the Permian is sensitive to oil and gas development, to the clearing that goes on in association with development. Um, and the lesser prairie chicken up in the, up in the panhandle of Texas. So just to wrap up, um, what do we know at this point? Well, as I said, there actually have been very few studies on the impacts of land development or impacts on land of this expanded oil and gas development. 
We can estimate the spatial extent of oil and gas development, but what we don't know is how that translates to an actual effect or impact on particular species or populations of species, because that type of work has not been done yet. Um, almost certainly, in order to gather that data, we would need to have baseline information about the species that occur in a given area, um, both before oil and gas development took place and then afterwards, and that data just does not exist. Um, there is no Surface Damages Act in Texas. The rest of the shale producing states in the United States all of the other states where significant amounts of shale are produced have something called a Surface Damages Act, which gives surface rights owners, going back to that severed property interest, the right to at least have notice from, from the company, the person who's gonna come in and exploit the mineral resources, and the right to negotiate, um, in many cases, about how that development will take place. We don't have a Surface Damages Act in Texas. Um, and nor do we have a, a, a Dormant Mineral Act, which is another sort of statutory safeguard that many states have adopted, which basically would give landowners the right, if the mineral rights are not exercised within some period of time, those mineral rights could be canceled or would have to be renegotiated. Um, so that's about where we are at this point. I, I, again, look forward to your questions during the question and answer period. Okay, we're kind of working our way down, you know, the air, the land, so next we're going to go to the water. And uh, our next speaker is Dr. Michael Young. He's an Associate Director of Environmental Systems at the Bureau of Economic Geology, UT Austin, and uh, he's going to look at water. Thank you. I realize I'm the third UT Austin speaker in a row here. I promise I'll, we'll be, I'll be the last one. Um, and, and also, it's, it's important all to recognize uh, Danny Reibel, who is, the, who is really the panel chair for TAMEST on the water side, and, and Denny Bullard, who also is a Texas Tech, and the three of us are, are writing, up this, uh, uh, writing up the section on water. And, and I wanted just to put this graphic up to, to kind of highlight a, a point that, that I'm hoping that the people in the audience that you all take away um, from this meeting is that many of these um, these six areas that we're talking about are very strongly interlinked and, um, and really decisions that are made in one area have sort of cascading effects potentially on other areas. So for example, um, when we're looking really at the water, this is just the water side of where, uh, of where it kind of touches on, on energy. And you can see all the way on the left, we're looking at propens and quarries. There's a lot of quarries in, in, in the state of Texas. We're looking at uh, um, areas of abandoned wells. Uh, possible, uh, you could see the sort of frac zone down near the, near the bottom. Of course, if uh, we're doing wastewater injection, as, uh, as, as Brian had mentioned, there's the potential for seismic, uh, seismic events and earthquakes. And then all of the above ground activities that are occurring in order to manage the water that's, uh, that's either being used for the hydraulic fracturing and on the, the true upstream side of, uh, uh, of the practice. And, and then the flowback water that comes back afterwards needs to be somehow managed. Is it, is it put in a pipe and, 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 uh, and, and sort of transmitted along a pipe? Is it put in a truck? Is it re-injected? Is it treated? All of those have some type of, of an implication. And, and our, our challenge then is to simply balance uh, what it is, uh, you know, what are the, you know, from an economic standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, how do we kind of balance all of those activities so that um, the companies are able to operate, the environment is preserved, and, and everybody is happy. So if we look at the sort of the conventional and the unconventional side, and I realize that we're talking about unconventional, these are, these are tight sands and shales that Christine had mentioned. And on the right side is really the conventional and the amount of water that's injected for conventional water flows. This is secondary, uh, secondary recovery for conventional reservoirs. These are larger 
ores that are found in sandstones. There's a lot of water that's being injected in order to essentially maintain pressure in the reservoirs, but that water is often recovered and there's no real pressure gain. So it's, it's essentially a, a, a zero void ratio, I think is what the term is. And, and that way, you're simply recycling the water through relatively uh, shallower reservoirs. If you, if you go to the left side of the picture, and, and by the way, those arrows, the thickness of the arrows is equivalent to, kind of equivalent to the volume of how much water we're talking about. If you go to the left side and you're really dealing with the unconventional, you can see the arrows next to those pipes there is, is giving a, a, the direction of where the water's going. So water is flowing back into the horizontal and to that lateral. It's then being collected at the surface and some of that water, that flow back and produced water, is then injected into deeper horizons, deeper than typically than the frac zone. And that's where the wastewater disposal is occurring. That's where uh, the earthquakes, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of concern about the earthquakes and things like that that Brian had mentioned. And I just wanted to sort of show that as a perspective. So what are we doing in, in our report? And we're following the same general approach that, uh, that, that Melinda, you know, she, she, um, she describes sort of what do we know, what don't we know, and okay, so what do we need to know in order to reduce risk and, and again, allow uh, water sustainability, reduce water contamination, things like that. And, and Danny and Danny and I, we, we use the approach of, let's first look at water source. So this is the water that's being used initially for the hydraulic fracturing process. And this could be brackish water, this, uh, which is you know, very salty water. It could be fresh water. Uh, from potable aquifers that are essentially owned by the landowners. Um, and then we look into areas of, okay, how much subsurface contamination is occurring from the fracking process itself? This is sort of the very high pressure uh, injection of water through those laterals that I showed in the previous slide that breaks the rock very close to where the well bore is. Uh, and that's basically essentially ramifying or, or sort of breaking the rock up and it's increasing the permeability of the rock so that the oil and gas can flow back into the well bore. And that's really what the process is. So then the water comes back, it then has to be managed at the surface and that's where the spills or leaks that's you know, where we sort of describe that. And then eventually the wastewater treatment or disposal. So we kind of looked at it like it was a cradle to grave, although that might be a little bit uh, too dramatic. So um, these are sort of the impacts that we came up with. And, and I'm sure that, that you all could, if you, if you really sat and, 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 and thought about it, there, there are probably a bunch of others. And, and, and we looked at a lot of literature. I, I would refer you to uh, the Environmental Protection Agency issued a report in 2015. And then their scientific panel issued another report earlier this year that really looked at the entire kind of universe of research that's been done on groundwater contamination and what the risks are to groundwater from hydraulic fracturing. So, you know, in terms of water availability, the volumes are not very large, but, but locally, it could be a significant amount of water. So, for example, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, all the water, when, when uh, gas prices were higher, was maybe less than a half a percent of the total water use in the Dallas area. Um, and so that's a very small amount. In fact, it's 30% uh, of water use in Dallas is from landscape irrigation of, of lawns. So just to give you a kind of a perspective of where the, where the differences are. If you go into parts of the Eagle Ford, that percentage goes up because it's a smaller community. There's not so much lawn watering. I suppose there's more ranching and things like that. So it really comes down to sort of the community impact of, of high water use versus low water use. So it is very geographically specific. Subsurface contamination from hydraulic fracturing, there's very few uh, instances of this that's occurring. It's, we would, we sort of, Put a, a, you know, it's a low risk, but it's not zero. And this really comes down to the standards of practice that industry is using to drill the well, to manage the water, and to when they're fracking the well. So they're not overpressuring, the wells are cemented properly, and all those kinds of things. Spills or leaks of fracturing fluid, we see this is probably the greatest risk. Um, because there's so much above ground handling, you're, you, you, you know, you're, you're moving a large volumes of water. This is in the many tens of thousands of acre feet of water per year. It's, 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 it's quite a bit. And so it's a common problem. It's, this is an industrial process. You know, the oil and gas operations is an industrial process. And so there are, uh, there are standards of practice to manage the water accordingly. I'm getting the sign, I gotta, I gotta go. So, um, and so then there's of course the wastewater treatment and disposal and trying to treat water that's 50,000 part per million, very salty water is really difficult. So you have to put it in trucks and drive it around, which has transportation issues, or you have to inject it, which has seismicity issues. 
uh, or you have to use compressors to clean it, which has air issues. So, you know, there's really not, there, there's no easy sort of silver bullet solution here, and I will put just these up there where the research needs are because, you know, we are .edu's and we like doing research, and so we see these as the, really the things that we're trying to focus on. What is the broader life cycle risk assessment of how we're managing the water? From the time we collect the water all the way to the time we treat it and inject it, we don't know that there's been an integrated risk assessment that's been monetized across the entire industry. We've not seen that. That would be very, very helpful. Characterizing the productivity of brackish groundwater, the state of Texas in the last ledge session passed uh, House Bill 30, which essentially directs the Texas Water Development Board to characterize the productivity of and the quality of brackish water aquifers in the state of Texas. So that is ongoing right now in specific aquifers one at a time. The potential of communication of water across fault systems this is a geomechanics problem. This is really a geology and a reservoir engineering issue. And then, of course, improved techniques for cost effectively treating the water so that it can be used again. If the water is injected, we're never going to get that water back. Are there things we can do with the water uh, that allows us, um, that's cost effective if we can treat it and use it for a variety of different purposes? And uh, with that, I'll, I'll put a little picture up here and I'll stop and let the next folks go. Thank you. So, um, our next speaker is John Barton. He's a former deputy executive director of the Texas Department of Transportation, TxDOT, and he's now a professor of practice for the Civil Engineering Department at Texas A&M University. Uh, John is going to speak about impacts of shale development on transportation. Thank you, Christine. Uh, as she noted, I am uh, the first speaker in a long line that uh, hasn't been from the University of Texas. Uh, I'm with uh, Texas A&M University, and it's a pleasure for me to be here with you this evening. Let me begin by also sharing with you that uh, Cesar Caroga with the Texas A&M Transportation Institute is working with me on this particular aspect of the task force effort and uh, has been the lead researcher for the Texas Department of Transportation in the state of Texas in the area of impacts that uh, the shale plays have had on transportation. Obviously, this has been an tre incredibly tremendously beneficial industry for the state of Texas, but it has uh, created an unprecedented growth in traffic volumes associated uh, with this activity in all types of traffic, all modes of traffic. The industry, however, is heavily dependent upon the movement of its commodities, whether that's the oil itself, water, uh, sand for fracking, the materials and the equipment to produce these wells uh, for, uh, by roadway. And so our efforts have focused primarily on the impacts to the roadways, uh, the safety consequences associated with those impacts, and then the financial consequences uh, related to all of those areas of activity. So I've just got a few slides that uh, I hope will convey this message to you. And I begin by trying to allow us to understand the magnitude of this challenge. When you look at these uh, this chart, and I know that it's difficult for you to read, it's showing the impacts of a single well from the time it is produced through the time it goes through its refracking cycle over 20 years in terms of truck volumes associated with one well. And so if you look at the Barnett shell, uh, a single well will generate about 5,500 truck, uh, truck traffic volume over the life of that well. Uh, if you go to the Eagle Four, because of the differences in the geology and the type of uh, mineral being extracted, that goes up to 16,000 trucks for a single well. And then in the Permian Basin where we've had this uh, industry for quite some time, it's about 11,000 trucks per well. So as you think about that, um, it's important to understand, well, what does that mean for the roadway network that supports these activities? And it's important to understand that in Texas and around the United States, and I would say across the globe, uh, our roads were not designed with this kind of activity in mind and this type of production approach uh, in consideration. A typical farm to market road is designed to carry 750,000 easels. An easel is simply a single axle on one loaded truck. And so if you think about that, an average 18 wheeler would have five axles or five easels for every time it goes down a roadway. All the way up to a US highway, which is one of the more uh, well developed and heavier trafficked roadways, designed to carry about 7 million easels uh, as it's uh, being used. 
Unfortunately, these traffic volumes uh, create much, much more uh, ESO loadings than that. So graphically, I wanted to represent this. This is uh, what uh, one well would do in a county here in Texas. This was done based on an actual analysis. And over 20 years, the roadway network would see this type of increased truck loading in terms of axles or easels. If it then is 10 wells, because as we know, there's not just one well in a county, uh, this, this is what the roadway impacts would look like. If there's 200 wells, which is well within what was permitted and actually being produced in this county, you start to see that you have these significant roadway loadings across the county. And ultimately to 493 wells, which was what was permitted at this time for this particular county. And so you can soon see that uh, these networks are receiving much greater traffic volumes in trucks than it was ever anticipated. And the results are going to be shown in these next few photographs. Uh, there have been severe pavement deterioration, uh, rutting, cracking, failures uh, that have been replete across the network. A lot of the traffic volume is uh, large enough and sustained uh, over a long enough period of time that they have to off track on the roadway. So you start to see roadways begin to get narrower and narrower and traffic running off the edge of the pavement causing safety concerns as well as impacts to the adjacent rights of way. Uh, several times they'll start impacting the roadway appurtenances. As you can see here, you've got a complete failure, but you also have a drainage structure that's been collapsed. And so when there is rain, and yes, it, it does rain in other parts of the state besides just here in Houston occasionally, um, then you have problems with drainage and flooding concerns. And then uh, at certain areas like this particular location where we've even gone in and we've widened the roadway, we've rebuilt it, it's holding up to the increased truck traffic, but the movements in and out of the well site start to off track on the roadways, creating uh, safety concerns. And of course, trucks having to run over the end of a culvert, uh, a pipe structure like is shown here, are serious concerns that uh, we are now addressing across the state. And then for those unpaved roadways that are not even graveled, that are often the field entrances, you get this tracking of material up on the roadway and causing uh, you no know, environmental issues as well as safety issues for not only the oil field industry traffic, but the, the adjacent uh, residential, if you will, or, or neighborhood traffic. So when we looked at the impacts, I think it's also important to understand that uh, while the weight of a vehicle is what most people keep in mind, that grows up linearly, but the impact on the roadway goes up exponentially. So let me just point out a few things here. If you look at the first set of data for a 4,000 uh, pound vehicle, which is an average passenger vehicle, and you compare that to an 80,000 pound vehicle, so if you look at the 80,000 pound line, it's telling you that an 80,000 pound vehicle weighs 20 times a 4,000 pound vehicle, but it creates 18,000 times the amount of consumption or roadway damage. If you look at that same 80,000 pound truck, which is what a normal legally loaded 18 wheeler here in the state of Texas would be, and compare that to a 100,000 pound load, so just 20,000 pounds overloaded carrying products for whatever purposes, it's only a 25% increase in weight, but it's a 240% increase in terms of consumption, or 2.4 times the amount of consumption. And that's something that is important to keep in mind because these weights are critically important to managing the overall challenge as we move forward. The financial implications are shown here, uh, over a billion dollars per year of additional consumption, and I use that term because that's really what's happening, these traffic volumes are consuming our roadways, is caused on our state highway facilities, foreign to market roads, state highways, U.S. highways, interstates. About $2 billion per year are the consequences for our local roads. Those are city streets and county roads. And the industry itself, because of the wear and tear on its vehicle caused by these deteriorated roadway conditions, is spending an additional $1.5 to $3.5 billion per year because of the consequences for its vehicles and its equipment. I mentioned safety, that's the most important thing, and I wanted to just share with you that um, we did an analysis of the crashes that occurred in these areas of the state, uh, the Barnett, the Eagle Ford, and the Permian Basin, as well as all other areas of the state, over two four-year periods, from 2006 to 2009, and then from 2010 and 2013. Uh, the green balls are good things. That's where the crashes are actually going down in terms of numbers. The red are where they are going up in terms of numbers. And what you can see is that as the Barnett shell play kind of tailed off in the 2010 to 2013 time period, uh, you saw a reduction in those crashes, which is a great thing. Unfortunately, in the Eagleford and the Permian, you started to see increases, and they're pretty large. Uh, 
The increases in rural and commercial vehicle crashes, those two categories combined, increased by 60% and 52% uh, during this time period of the second four-year period. Unfortunately, fatal crashes went up even more. They went up by 76% and 88% in those two shell plays that were increasing during that same time period. And so there's obviously serious safety issues that uh, these types of activities uh, start to create because there are increased traffic volumes and that we have to respond to. Uh, this is just a graph showing that in some areas, uh, especially most rural areas of Texas, the percent increase in these crashes went up dramatically as these shell plays were occurring because, again, we had unprecedented volumes of traffic on roadways that weren't designed for them and in communities where they weren't honestly familiar with this kind of traffic volume. So as you look at the safety consequences, uh, they too add up to about a billion dollars per year. Our research reflects that, and, and again, I know you can't see that, but you can see in the Eagleford Shell and Permian Basins, those uh, costs due to safety impacts of crashes started to increase uh, over this uh, second four-year period of time. So to summarize, uh, our, we currently are looking at developing a strategic research roadmap uh, to move forward with our initiative. We want to understand uh, what the policies that we put in place and how those would affect uh, our ability to operate a system and the other consequences of the transportation network uh, on our communities. We also want to understand what the financial consequences of those are and the trade-offs, if you will, of all these various aspects because uh, there are always trade-offs in, in how we respond to these issues and understanding how they interrelate with one another is something that we think is critically important to the future of this uh, task force effort. Uh, last two things, uh, our major takeaways are fairly simple. There are extremely large volumes of heavy truck traffic associated with in this industry curr currently using technology that's available as today. And our roadway network that is supporting this industry, and again, it's a tremendously valuable industry to our state, we're just not adequately designed for these kinds of traffic volumes. And because of that, there have been consequences in, in, in terms of payment consumption, as well as crash rates and increases in these areas. Uh, but the good news is that it appears that it's relatively low cost uh, in terms of how to respond to this. So the benefit to cost ratio is very positive for being able to respond to this. Last thing is that um, we are considering what our recommendations should be for additional research and how to move forward. Just a few things that I wanted to share quickly is that understanding what is happening is important. This is really just a logistics issue. So the availability and the quality of the data that we can get about the increased activity and where it may occur in the future will help us respond more effectively. There needs to be improved communication and coordination between all agencies and all levels of government responding to this because it does transcend across a lot of different agencies in the state and local governments. And we also need to make sure that we are putting into place a multimodal industry for transportation because right now far too much of this traffic is being borne on roadways and there's an opportunity to put more on rail and pipelines and waterways and we want to explore that further. And then ultim ultimately we know that in order to do these things, you have to be able to pay for them. So having a sustainable and a reliable transportation funding supply is important to the future. So I thank you for the opportunity and look forward to your questions. Yes, so those questions are coming in, by the way. I've been kind of having a look at them. So we've got one more on the panel. And this is uh, Dr. Jean Theodori. He's a professor of sociology at Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas. And he's going to look at the socioeconomic impacts. OK, thank you. Uh, I, too, would like to begin by acknowledging my co-researchers on this project, uh, Urs Kreuter and uh, Omar Garcia. Urs is at Texas A&M, and, and Omar is at, uh, with Steer down in South Texas. There we go. All right. So 11 years ago, I snapped this photo up in Johnson County, Texas. And it spoke to me at the time. And what did it speak about? Well, obviously, there's some economic impacts to be had with uh, shale energy development. Uh, as you can see on the screen, I, we covered up the individual's name and the phone number. I don't even know if that phone number still works. But, uh, you know, in this report, we are summarizing, the, you know, the social and economic uh, issues associated with shale development. And without a doubt, there is an economic impact. If we look at the shale plays across the state, 
uh, you know, billions of dollars annually in economic output, billions of dollars to local governments, billions to the state of Texas, billions in property tax revenues, millions uh, each year to the uh, permanent school fund. So those would be some positive aspects associated with it on the economic side. And John just mentioned some of the consequences, the economic consequences associated uh, with Shell Energy Development, and we'll be uh, analyzing uh, uh, those. And so I, I appreciate Michael's comment earlier that these six areas up here are interrelated, and they really are. Uh, and, and so far, you've heard really about some of these ecological impacts uh, associated with shale development. And so the team that I'm working with, you know, we're charged with uh, summarizing some of those uh, social issues. And, and I would actually put all six of these areas under an umbrella of, you know, community level impacts. And I think Michael spoke to that, that also. And, and so, the literature, in, as we reviewed it in the state of Texas, uh, we look at some of these objective issues, and you know, and there's a list there that that researchers have have examined, in and around the shell plays in Texas, crime and development, setback, distance, regu you know, negotiations, and you could go on down the list uh, to some of those local level actions. What do people do? in response to increased energy development in and around their communities. At the same time, there's a, a growing literature on the subjective issues associated with, with energy development. And, and you can see on uh, the bullet list there, uh, you know, overall perceptions. What do people think of the oil and gas industry uh, and hydraulic fracturing? Uh, you know, what do they perceive to be some of these opportunities and some of these consequences? Who do people trust when it comes to providing information about shale energy development? Uh, how do communities and industry communicate? And then we have some other issues dealing with self-reported knowledge and self-reported understanding of, of energy development. And so what I want to just say right now here uh, on these subjective issues is that, you know, in sociology we, we mentioned the Thomas theorem. The Thomas theorem is alive and well in shell energy development. What does that mean? That means that what we perceive is real in its consequences. And so in the report we have reviewed these articles that have examined the perceptions and uh, we will make you know, a uh, statement about how perception is reality oftentimes when it comes to shale energy development. I mentioned uh, Tom Greider and Rick Cranick here on this slide, uh, some work that they did on, in the Intermountain West uh, uh, on the boom towns. And you know, the quote says it all, it seems clear that analyses which focus solely or even predominantly upon some of those objective conditions that I had on that previous slide, you know, is likely to miss what can be very important in understanding people's experiences with industry. And that would be some of those subjective issues that, that we will mention. I guess, uh, you know, in my work and, and, and my colleagues' work, we have found this, this general paradox uh, that sort of runs through the, the uh, general population. You know, the general population tends to distrust the intrusion of the gas industry and dislike certain social and or environmental problematic issues that they perceive to accompany the development, yet at the same time, they appreciate and welcome the economic and those service-related benefits that accompany the industry. Uh, I'll show this slide here, and, and again, this is just a, an example from one of our studies in the Barnett. You know, why should we as sociologists or social scientists focus on the perception? Well, as I said, perception is real in its consequences, and in this case, just a snippet from one of the studies uh, where we were measuring individual level civic actions, what people did in response to increased development in the Barnett. And you could see there, I had a numerous uh, social and, 
and uh, environmental and economic uh, uh, items in the survey, those would be our independent variables. Those are those perceptual, vari perceptual variables predicting action at the local level. And those odds ratios tell it all, you know, that, that the social and economic perceptual variable is extremely important when it comes to, you know, putting in that, in that variable in our models to predict behaviors at the local level. The more negatively people perceive some of these social and environmental issues, the more likely they are to have done these things. And they're more likely to have contacted a uh, local official to complain about an issue. And in my years of doing survey research, you know, we ask who you vote for, but most people vote against, so we put the vote against in there. And at the bottom, the same thing, that the more negatively you perceive these social and environmental issues, the more likely you are to have voted against uh, a local official because of his or her uh, position on shale gas development. Th those were data from Texas. We did some, some work up in the Marcellus. This slide is very similar to the last one, except the in independent variable is a little different there. It's support or opposition. But the same pattern emerges. Uh, you know, the, the, the more likely you, you are to oppose development, the more likely you are to have complained or voted against an official. Uh, but if you support that development, the more likely you are to uh, a vote for somebody who's, who's in favor of increased development. I took this uh, headline years ago from the Dallas Morning News. You, these pop up all over the state of Texas. Things are happening at the local level uh, through grassroots movements and, and uh, citizen opposition to some of these uh, developments. So I'll conclude with, with this slide here. Again, going back to what I mentioned earlier, the, the social scientists are looking at both objective and subjective issues associated uh, with shale energy development. One side, we have the industry. The industry knows what it's doing. The in, they live in the objective world. Over here, we have the general population who perceives to know what the industry is doing. There's a huge gap. And that's why I have these two worlds up here. There's a huge gap, if we look at it that way, between what the population believes they know or they tend to, to say they know, understand, and what some of the other objective issues are, both good and bad, trust me. And so what, what uh, a lot of the social scientific work is doing is trying to minimize that gap between the objective world and the subjective world when it comes to shell energy development. And my time is up. Okay, team. Are you ready for some questions? <laughs> All right, um, and you know what? We're getting a lot of really good ones. Um, so um, I'm gonna start with one that's kind of targeting Brian. Um, so here it is. Injection wells are not only used in oil and gas production. Chemical manufacturers account for some injection wells across the state of Texas. Are these wells included in your data? And why is oil and gas taken the brunt of the criticism? I, I don't think oil and gas is taking the brunt. I think that uh, the example I gave from the Rocky Mountain Arsenal was uh, an injection example. And so um, all large volume injectors um, have the capability of putting fluids in the ground. And the questions that we don't know is how far those fluids will go, how fast, and uh, where the faults are. We do have hope, though, of understanding those subsurface faults and understanding the flows of the materials, whether or not they're oil and gas or other kinds of um, disposal operations. Okay, thanks. Um, here's one that might be for David and maybe John as well. Have you looked at the amount of CO2 emitted by trucks? You want to start with that one? Uh, so, in terms of air quality, uh, the biggest contributors for a variety of different types of, 
uh, air quality impacts tend to be the wells themselves and the supply chain. There are one or two examples of that, and people have looked at the truck traffic that's so important to roadways. Again, lots of overlap between all these issues. And the biggest uh, impact of the trucks are the fine particles, the so-called particulate matter, especially the very fine diesel particulate matter that uh, various jurisdictions regulate as an air toxic. That's a, the big issue dominated by the trucks. The other issues, the greenhouse gases, the uh, smog forming pollutants really tend not to be as much dominated by the trucks as the actions directly along the supply chain. Yeah, I, I can only add that uh, it is being evaluated specifically and most intensely uh, during the Barnett shell play as it was playing out because the Dallas Fort Worth area is a non attainment zone. And, and uh, as we just mentioned, the, the, realist, the biggest issue that we discovered was not uh, in the, the carbon emissions, CO2 emissions, it was really in the particulate matter, even in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex because of the fuel consumption as well as the impacts on the roadway, which does contribute to the, uh, car the uh, particulate matter as well. Okay, let's try one on you, Michael. Uh, how are aquifers legally protected relative to risk of contaminating them during oil and gas rights and extraction process? Seems like aquifer <laughs> protection rights would, would be superior to oil and gas. Okay, so um, the oil and gas industry is regulated by the Railroad Commission of Texas. Um, and, uh, and, and not being a regulator, uh, I don't want to speak directly to the regulations, however, Melinda here is a, an attorney and probably knows that much better than I do, but I would say that I think that, um, that the oil and gas industry is specifically exempted from, um, from a number of regulations that the Railroad Commission is, uh, is, is charged with, with sort of managing, and, and, uh, um, and I'll let uh, Melinda take, if she want to take it from there. Yeah, so as I understood the question, it's partially about whose rights are superior, whether the water rights holder, the <clears throat> excuse me, the surface owner who owns the, the water under his or her property, his rights are superior to the oil and gas company. And that is, in Texas, sort of an unsettled question, frankly, but arguably the oil and gas industry, which does have the right to come in and extract water to use in the process of drilling and production, um, if they cause contamination, Michael's right, they're, they're exempt from certain statutes, but they would certainly be required to clean that up, though, under Railroad Commission rules. So that's a little, hopefully that clarifies a little bit. Okay. I'm going to give you another one. <laughs> um, so our land system in Texas provides for the private ownership of mineral rights, and that clearly has facilitated energy development here. I've consulted energy clients in places like Algeria, Colombia, Peru, uh, so out, outside of the U.S. Um, and these rights belong to the government only. While there may be issues regarding land use here, our system allows much more flexibility than in other countries. So do you have a comparison on land use incidents such as spills, et cetera, under our system versus those in other countries where, where the oil and gas is handled by a national oil company? The answer is no. I don't, don't have that comparative data. It'd be very interesting to see um, if there even exists data like that. Um, there's no question that the private ownership of mineral rights has been a tremendous economic boom in the United States. I mean, no question about that. So I, would, I wouldn't take issue with that at all. This is my talk, really my group is just looking at what are the impacts, again, on those surface resources. Sorry about this mic, it's kind of echoey, but what are the impacts on those surface resources, both for the surface owner, but then also for the public at large that has an interest in the ecosystem um, of oil and gas development, extensive development on the surface, that's all. Thanks. Um, David, back to you. Um, have we been able to identify the varying factors of the minority of sites that are producing the majority of the greenhouse gas emissions? If so, what are these factors? What do they do differently? 
So again, I'll use the analogy that I'd used earlier, which is with the transportation fleet. So if you look at cars that are super emitters, there are a variety of reasons why those cars might be super emitters. One is it might just be an old car. Uh, older technology, uh, not the most recent technology. Another might be an equipment malfunction. And a third might be an intentional modification uh, by uh, the user of the vehicle, the operator of the vehicle. And uh, we know that all three of those factors are in operation in the supply chain for oil, natural gas, but there's very limited data at the moment on exactly what is causing the super emitters. Uh, and we're just beginning to understand their extent, very little information about which of those relative causes, although we know all three are in play, which of those causes are most important. Thanks very much. Gene. Um, what's the average productive life of a hydraulic fracturing site? And what, if anything, do companies do to minimize the economic impact of leaving the surrounding communities? I'm sorry, you have... You want to hear it again? I want, I want to hear that again. Yeah. Okay. So what's the average Today? productive life of a hydraulic fracturing site? And what, if anything, do companies do to minimize the economic impact of leaving the surrounding community? Well. The, uh, you're asking about the overall well development or just the, the fracking stage? I, you know what, answer it how you want to. Well, so, uh, so you clarify. Yeah. Okay, because, because those, those are different. I mean, yeah, yeah. the hydraulic fracturing is the, is the stimulation and completion process, you know, that occurs after the, the drilling. Uh, so, so we're looking at, uh, uh, a month and a half, probably total, uh, on on the on that site, uh, and so the question again is, what can the companies do to mitigate the economic impacts after that well is completed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, oftentimes, you know, if we think about it, though, uh, in and around these communities, there's more than one well being developed, so so the the company. Uh, the industry officials are, you know, they're going to be in and the workers are going to be in and around uh, those communities, uh, you know, for extended periods of, of times, uh, eating in the local restaurants, staying in the local hotels, uh, etc. But uh, that is, that goes back to that notion that I mentioned of, of work that needs to be done on this communication. There is a there is a lack of communication that we've found in many of these communities between industry and between, uh, you know, the local elected officials. Uh, and so, you know, obviously there's, there's work that needs to be done there to understand and engage in those planning process to diversify, uh, you know, economic development uh, after, these, after the, uh, the industry leaves those communities. Very much. Let's go back to Brian. Uh, studies have shown that it's not the monthly injection rates, but rather instantaneous injection rates that have a bigger impact on earthquakes and pore pressure increase. Given that companies uh, and governments view water injection rates on a monthly basis, why or, or should there be more instantaneous monitoring for pressure and flow rates on the injection wells? I think this is part of an ongoing discussion, even here in the state of Texas. And I think there's a realization that uh, both the injection rates and the total volumes are important to these processes, as well as the um, geologic materials in which the uh, injections are, are occurring. And so this kind of integrated um, work, which involves regulators, it involves industry and researchers, is in the spirit of the ongoing work at TexNet and the BEG, um, to try to, to um, help um, both our regulators and our industry to, to try to identify these issues, as well as things like um, downhole pressures as, as we begin to inject. I would add that uh, um, understanding where the faults are, too, are, are the other piece of this, of this process. Um, it's critical um, observational data that will provide us a, the methodologies then to um, mitigate these kinds of effects. Have we 
found any faults because of injection? Um, I think that uh, well, that's one of the reasons that uh, the seismic monitoring that, that we do, because uh, as we do inject, um, if it stimulates faults at depth that may not be mapped, um, precise subsurface locations then provide a map of those, those faults. Um, again, I'll go back to TextNet. It has a uh, portable instrumentation capability of about 36 instruments. And its purpose is, as a sequence begins, is to deploy that, understand those subsurface faults to help us with the decisions of the next step process. Okay, great. John. Um, thanks for acknowledging the problem that the movement of hydraulic fracturing trucks uh, cause on regular traffic. How far ahead in the future do you see any major changes happening to improve this situation? And how might it impact traffic in major Texas cities? We, uh, we are benefiting from the fact that the uh, industry has receded, um, not in an, in an economic way. Obviously, there are a lot of people that uh, have been uh, impacted because of the receding of the industry. But uh, from a transportation perspective, it's giving us the opportunity to uh, catch up, if you will, and to plan for the future. Um, I think significant uh, investments in midstream activities is, is going to be important to put in pipelines where uh, perhaps they have not existed uh, prior to this and to understand how technologies can evolve uh, through um, the use of temporary water lines as an example for the movement of water rather than having to do it through trucking. Uh, the rail industry is also responding and planning not only for what they've done, but for what they perceive to happen. Because we, we know one thing here in Texas as it relates to the oil and gas industry, and that is that it is uh, sinusoidal in nature, and it will come back. And so uh, we need to prepare for that rebound in the industry and understand what to do about it. Um, in terms of traffic in, in uh, major metropolitan areas, uh, in the foreseeable future, I think that uh, the reality is this. Um, here in Houston, as an example, the Port of Houston um, receives and processes a lot of activity that was related to the industry and still is. Uh, that will continue to occur. Uh, there are new technologies for moving of significant cargo and commodities that uh, can take some of that traffic off of our roadways and put it onto alternative solutions. But those require significant investments in, in terms of new infrastructure and, and the financial consequences of that are pretty significant. So um, transportation technologies are evolving. Uh, the most notable now is uh, self-driving vehicles. Uh, those things also result in self-driving cars, or trucks, excuse me. And there was recently a, a fairly famous truckload of uh, beverages delivered from one part of Colorado to another part of Colorado uh, in a truck that drove itself. And uh, those kind of technologies can allow that traffic to occur in off-peak hours from uh, other traffic. And uh, those kinds of technologies may be pr able to provide not only a, a benefit to the impacts to other traffic in terms of congestion, but also significant safety benefits as well. So was it Coors Light? It was Coors. I don't believe it was Coors Light, uh, <laughs> but there was a truckload of beer delivered from the Rocky Mountain uh, Brewery I believe to Denver, so uh, it traveled several hundred miles in a, a truck that drove itself. Okay, um, you actually anticipated a question on the railroad uh, plans. Um, let, me, let me get you for one more. Um, since the state benefits from the royalties from the development, while the local county pays the cost of these local roads, how is the state working to reimburse these counties for road repairs? The Texas legislature considered this uh, at great length during the last session and did make a decision to distribute uh, some funding to counties that were impacted uh, by the uh, industry. And uh, I think we noted that there are not quite all 254 counties are producing counties. Uh, our math indicated that all 254 counties are impacted, either as pass-through injection or production counties or a combination of, of those three. And so all counties in the state of Texas uh, in some way are impacted in terms of transportation. Uh, the legislature voted to, to distribute to those counties based on a formula they established, uh, $225 million uh, to be used on local roads and an additional $225 million to be used on state facilities. Uh, but they also, through uh, 
a referendum that the voters got to vote on have increased transportation funding significantly uh, through uh, the severance taxes being paid uh, by the industry and into the rainy day fund. And so all of those funds are flowing back to the counties uh, to be used either on state facilities or local facilities and working with the Texas Department of Transportation, particular in terms of safety related improvements, uh, those county roads and city streets can be improved using a combination of those resources. So the legislature has acknowledged it. Uh, I'm, I'm very confident that as we enter into the next legislative session, that will continue to be an item of discussion and debate by the legislature in the counties and cities. Brian, I've seen this question before, so I, I'm sure you've had to answer it before, but I think it's a good one. Uh, is causing moderate earthquakes bad in the long run? I mean, might they prevent major earthquakes from happening? What's the chance of a major earthquake from injection wells, and should we limit them near metro, metropolitan areas? I, I'd invite the uh, questioner to come to my earthquakes and volcanoes class tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that's difficult to understand is the magnitude scale, and it's a logarithmic scale. And what it means is the magnitude six earthquake is 10 times more ground motion than a magnitude five. Um, it's actually 30 times more in, in energy. And so the earthquakes we've had in Texas have been threes and fours. Um, damage, um, significant damage starts as we move into the mid fours to the fives. So let's say that we had to generate um, 900 magnitude threes um, that would uh, then be equivalent to one magnitude five. Um, it just doesn't work. The mathematics doesn't work. And so the, these ideas about small earthquakes relieving the stress. It is an open question, though, about what we might expect to be the largest magnitude earthquake if they were induced. We look around the globe, and typically we see things that are in the magnitude 6 range. We've seen that most recently with magnitude 5.8 um, in Pawnee, Oklahoma. Those are damaging earthquakes, particularly in a region um, that has unreinforced brick buildings because we haven't had a historical earthquake risk. David, do you uh, have, um, can, can you uh, address a comparison between supply chain emissions of methane for oil and gas versus coal? Specifically for methane uh, emissions, uh, coal mining can release methanes and methane, and it's very region specific. So there are some regions, for example, the Four Corners region of the United States has coal bed methane that has extensive amounts of methane, but it's highly variable. So uh, all I'm going to do is give you averages, uh, but. On average, throughout the entire country, in general, the em emissions of methane along the natural gas supply chain are greater than they are from methane displaced from coal. But again, there are numbers of exceptions, and it depends very much upon what uh, s type of coal seam that you're talking about. Well, I've got you busy, and your mic works. Um, can you comment a little bit on air pollution effects of the flaring? Flaring the methane, or flaring whatever they're flaring, but flaring. <laughs> well, let me just first talk a little bit about the magnitude of flaring. Uh, in the United States overall, uh, the upstream oil and gas operations uh, flares, uh, according to what's the information collected by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency flares about 1% of the total gas withdrawal from formation. So 1% is the number to keep in mind. That's very skewed. So this phenomenon of small fraction of, of the sites giving you the majority of the activity of the, uh, I believe it's 21,000 flares in upstream oil and gas that reported to the Environmental Protection Agency last year, uh, less than 100 of those flares accounted for more than half of the flaring activity. So it's a very small number 
a very large flaring uh, locations. Mm -hmm. And those tend to be associated with oil production rather than the gas production. So it's what would be called associated gas. The gas is associated with oil. You might not have the infrastructure to get that gas to market. It will be flared. Uh, and a uh, very small number of those around the United States. Nevertheless, you do have uh, situations like the Eagle Ford where during certain phases of a well's life, for example, the completion process, flaring will go on. So uh, there is flaring that goes on in Texas, but in general, the bulk of the flaring activity nationwide that accounts for roughly the 1% of the gas that we flare is associated with associated gas, small numbers of flares. Melinda. Um, and I think also, Jean, we'll let Melinda try this one first, and then I think this could, uh, and anybody else, I'm always being so specific. <laughs> Um, okay, um, how do the severed property and mineral rights affect homeowners on the lands that are being developed? Well, so most oil and gas development, of course, occurs in less populated areas with the Barnett Shale in Texas being a major um, <laughs> exception to that observation. But if, if you have a ranch, for example, where there's oil and gas development, um, again, the, if the ranch owner who might have his or her home on the ranch does not own the minerals, then the, ran then the ranch owner's property rights are going to be affected by that oil and gas development. Again, there's lots of, um, if, if the two parties have negotiated a surface use agreement, which depending on the circumstances of the mineral ownership, may or may not be something that the surface owner would have the leverage to demand from, from the mineral owner. If there's a surface use agreement, though, then the development would take place in accordance with the terms of that agreement. But if there's not a surface use agreement, um, the only thing that really limits the mineral owner's or the, the operator's ability to exploit and use the surface is a very narrow judicial doctrine in Texas called the Accommodation Doctrine, which has not been widely um, applied. It's only been applied in a couple of cases here, but it does put some limits on the mineral owner's ability to um, interfere with an established land practice on the surface. But that's a very long answer. For The short answer is that that ranch owner, unless there's a surface use agreement, has very little leverage to require the mineral owner to put a well in a particular location or to remove equipment at the end of operations or to limit the amount of clearing that's done on the surface, you know, to, to pour the concrete for a pad or whatever else might occur. So. I, I would answer that by with, with the notion of it depends. And it depends on whether or not the mineral owners are local or extra local. And some of the work that I'm familiar with shows that, that uh, you know, there's this perception, and there's a study in North Texas in one particular county where this shows that the mineral owners live outside of the state. And so the perception of the local community is that this money's being generated and it's being, you know, the royalties are going out of state. And other communities that are, where I'm familiar and we've done some work, uh, a lot of those mineral owners reinvested that money, put that money back into the community. So the perception of the development was different based upon the, uh, whether or not the mineral owners were local or extra local. Well, um, I don't know if uh, somebody's gonna give us a high, high sign. I've got one more I wanted to ask sort of the group. Is that okay? Okay, so anybody, um, whoever wants to address this, and could be more than one of you, what's been the impact of the sudden drop in oil prices on these subjects? Anybody want to grab that? Well, I'll just start and John jump in, but I mean, we see the, the, the boom-bust cycle in many of these communities. I mean, it's going to reoccur 
over and over and over. And those communities that are, do are more well off have diversified their economies. Those where, you know, the, it's just oil and gas and that, is, that has been, you know, the, the breadbasket here for the last few months and then when the prices uh, drop, uh, you know, I was just down in, in a uh, South Texas community and talking to a, a, a local uh, resident and he said, you know, the business to be in today is the repo business because they're repossessing all these pickups that these young guys went out and bought when they got their first paycheck and now they can't make the, the payments on them. So, I mean, there, there, are, there are just, you know, numerous uh, issues associated with with the drop in prices. Yeah, for transportation, I would just say the most immediate is the obvious, and I've already stated that. And the traffic volumes, particularly heavy truck traffic volumes, have decreased significantly, which allows local jurisdictions and the State Department of Transportation to respond to those areas where consequences and impacts have occurred, and to make improvements and to plan for the future and to address the safety challenges that were identified. Um, I think it, it also allowed for more work of that type to be done at a more economical value. And, and by that, what I mean is that during the boom, uh, like anything else, simple economics, supply and demand, uh, the industry was competing for the same materials and employees and equipment that road building and uh, construction and maintenance is re dependent upon. And so the price of materials is lower, the availability of equipment and manpower is more uh, available and so uh, it's dro driven down the cost of those activities significantly I would I would say uh, am I on I would say that from from the broader perspective I think that the drop in oil and gas prices has given uh, the industry and and the communities and the research the researchers a chance to take a little bit of a breather and to have an opportunity to really look at some of these issues uh, look at some of the construction practices, look at the road building, for example, and particularly on the water side, so that when, when, when oil prices go back up, we're going to be much better informed, and we're going to be able to come up with solutions um, in, in a much more, uh, I think, ho holistic way so that we're able to address the problems better. I would say um, with a warning that time and space correlation uh, without a physical understanding is, is a very dangerous business, but uh, the seismicity has decreased. <laughs> I'll just say one last thing. That the, obviously, the impact on land resources is diminished if there's less activity going, you know, going on across the landscape. But interestingly, for at least two of the rare species that I mentioned just in passing, the dune sagebrush lizard and the lesser prairie chicken, um, both of those are, have conservation plans associated with them that are funded by industry largely. So when, with industry not really engaged in a whole lot of, well, in the Permian, actually, there's a lot of activity, but with the prairie chicken up in the panhandle, activity has dropped off quite a bit. And what that means is there's actually less funding available for some of the studies that need to be done um, to figure out the long-term conservation needs of those species. And I'll just quickly close by noting that uh, while less oil and gas activities may mean less emissions directly from oil and gas uh, operations. It's important also to recognize that as we've gotten much more oil and gas activity in, in the state of Texas, and as we've switched from coal to natural gas, we've seen multiple uh, and substantial air quality benefits from that. And so uh, there are multiple sides to uh, the effect of the downturn. Mm -hmm. So I want to say a couple things before we close, and I'm pretty sure that Ramanan is going to finalize everything. Uh, oh, okay, even better. Okay. But uh, I want to thank the audience uh, uh, for coming. I'm really appreciative that you're here, and special thanks to those of you that submitted questions. And um, there are some we didn't get to. Um, so I think in the reception that's following, the panelists are still going to be here and uh, feel free to approach them with the questions we missed. Um, and uh, just again, special thanks uh, to all of you that you're here, and uh, this is actually helping inform our study, I gotta say, so thanks a lot. Uh, good evening. 
Uh, I'm Radha Radhakrishnan, uh, Managing Director of UH Energy here at the University of Houston. I'd like to thank our panelists uh, from TAMIST, Shale Task Force, and, uh, and to our moderator, Dr. Christine Economides. Thank you all for taking the time from your very busy schedule. I'm sure you will all agree that they have taken such a complex you know, question, uh, loaded with lots of emotion, and uh, tried to present uh, as much as possible in an unemotional and fact-based way. Thank you all for that. As a token of our appreciation, we'd like to have these uh, plaques for you. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so she's saying I should continue. Okay, I'll do that. I would also like to thank our media sponsor, uh, Houston Public Media. There are several people who have been working behind the scenes to make this uh, very smooth and easy to go. So I'd like to thank uh, UH Energy student ambassadors and the Energy Coalition students. These are all people who helped you in getting registered and then coming uh, and uh, take your seats. Um, we invite you to stay for the reception. You know, pretty soon, as soon as we wrap up, all those doors will open up and it'll open into the reception area. And uh, please uh, join us uh, for some snacks and some drinks. Finally, thank you all for coming. Uh, we really look forward to seeing you at the next symposium on February 15th. And it is going to be on nuclear energy risks arts, and potential. And you can also visit our website and learn more. Please enjoy the reception. Thank you very much. Thank you.